I'm going to do just a very basic kind of uh, surface level, and I'm just going to trust that God, when I give you some points, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the, the seven most uh, marriage killers uh, right now in our nation, according to statistics. And I'm not going to dive deep into them. This isn't going to be an in-depth Bible study at all. Um, but I'm just going to trust you and your uh, marriage partner after this to take, maybe you both pick a different one, but you take one out of the seven, whether it's good or bad, and say, here's the one that I want us to work on for the next year. Is that an agreement, everybody? Come on, even if you have gray hair, okay, everyone? Okay, so uh, let me just start off so I know who I'm talking to. How, how many here are married? Let me just see your hand. You're married? Oh, wow, that's a lot. Okay, so put your hands down. Now, now this is an either-or question. How many of you are single in the room? Let me see your hands. Now, everybody didn't raise your hand. There's only, two, okay, raise your hands if you're single. Raise your hands if you're single. Don't be ashamed of it. Raise your hand. Okay, look around the room. So that might could be solved right now by looking around the room. <laughs> Just saying, all right. <laughs> that was a bad setup, wasn't it? All right. I seen one guy back there going, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, anyway, sorry, sorry. So today is survival strategies for marriage. And how many of you know we live in a society right now, it's kind of a disposable society. Come on, how many are old enough to remember disposable cameras? Remember that? Like you would take them and get your pictures and never see your camera again, right? Uh, and so we had disposable cameras. They were really disposable. And uh, so we live in a society that is just like if it's broken, we just throw it away and we get a new one. And uh, so we got disposable cameras. I, I, I had a whole list, but how many are real thankful for disposable diapers? How many know that was a really good invention, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we have treated marriage oftentimes within this same way. America, and even sometimes in the church world, we've adopted this philosophy like, let's give it a whirl. Let's give it a try. Let's see how it works out. And if it doesn't work out, we'll just throw that away and go try to find the right person. And last week, we tried to just start destroying the myth of trying to find the right person when we were talking to those that are in dating relationships. And our big thought last week was this, stop looking for the right person or stop looking for the perfect mate and work on becoming the perfect mate. I mean, no, that's probably some pretty good advice, right, everybody? And, and so with that in mind, I remembered this story of this perfect guy. Now, don't say nothing, women. Don't say a word, all right, unless you say, he's talking about you, babe. All right, all right. Did you hear Patty? She was like, "Woohoo!" Thank you, honey. Appreciate it. 34 years yesterday, everybody. Just want you to know. So there's this story of this perfect man, and he found a perfect woman, and so they had a perfect courtship, and then they had a perfect wedding, and then they together they lived a life that was absolutely perfect, of course. How I many know this is a make-believe story already, right? And so on one snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, the perfect couple was out, and they noticed somebody on the side of the road looked like they were broke down on the roadside in distress. So the, being the perfect couple, they pulled over to see if they could offer any help. And lo and behold, there was Santa Claus. So they picked up Santa Claus because his sleigh was broken down. And being the perfect couple, they decided, hey, we're going to help you deliver the rest of the toys to the boys and girls. Can we all get a ah? And so they started doing that, but the weather kept getting bad and worse and worse, and finally they had a wreck. It's a terrible story, and two of the three people died that night. Does anybody want to guess which one survived? Any guesses in the room? How many know for the sake of your marriage, maybe you shouldn't guess? How many know that, right? Uh, well, one answer was a woman answered and says, well, it was the perfect woman, of course, now, this is the woman answering and said it was the perfect woman that survived because we all know there's no such thing as Santa Claus. <laughs> and we all know there's no such thing as a perfect man. And all the ladies said, amen, right? Now, hold on. Before you laugh too loud, us men, we have a little response to your smart aleck response. Uh, and our response to your response is, so if there's no perfect man and there's no perfect, or there's no Santa Claus, then that must mean the perfect woman was driving the car. That's why there was a wreck in the first place. Uh, 
Come on, men, can I get an amen? Well, so far, I'm only causing more problems. How many of you know that, right? Well, you know, good storytelling, you got to create the problem before you solve the problem. I read an article years ago. It's a little dated, but I think it's still worth it. Here's the picture of the perfect wife. Now, the perfect wife, what every man wants, a little bit dated, but just follow the illustration. Always beautiful and happy. Now, guys, just, just, guys, just, just look straight ahead at me. Just don't, amen. just act like, I <laughs> every once in a while you can throw me a wink like, all right, so here we go, always beautiful and happy, never sick, only allergic to jewelry. <laughs> I, I told you, shut up, man. I'm trying to help you, brother. All right, so anyway, insist on moving furniture by herself because it's good for her figure. Expert at cooking and cleaning, hobbies include mowing the yard. <laughs> Favorite expressions are, what can I do for you, dear? Wishes you would go out more with the guys so that she could get more sewing and ironing done. <laughs> Come on, guys, it's okay, yeah. Just look at your spouse and say, he's talking about you, babe. But here's the reality, here's what he gets. I'm just the, I'm just the messengers, ladies. Here's what he gets. She speaks 140 words a minute. With gusts up to 180. She's a light eater. As soon as it's light, she's eating. I'm just saying. And where there's... Somebody got a nerve touched right there, boy. Leave my Twinkies alone. All right. Where there's smoke, there she is cooking. Just a little fun, guys. So I'm an equal opportunist, so... Here's a picture of the perfect husband. Are you ladies ready? All right. The perfect husband. What every woman. Do you notice the list is a lot shorter? (laughs) I just want him to be like human, you know, (laughs) what every woman wants. He's a brilliant conversationalist. He's sensitive. Oh, he's kind. He's gentle. He's loving. So far, she's described a woman. How many know what I'm talking about? Sensitive, kind, gentle, and loving. Hard worker. Helps around the house. Loves washing dishes and vacuuming. But here's what she gets. He's a miracle worker at home. Anytime he's working at home, it's a miracle. (laughs) He has occasional flashes of silence that makes his conversation brilliant. You might think about that one a little bit. He takes her to the restaurants, and one day he might even take her in. (laughs) Hey, I'm just the messenger. This is an old article I found. I just thought it's perfect because oftentimes we're looking for or expecting our spouse to be the perfect person. 35, almost 36 years of ministry now, uh, we have sat with many couples and talked to many couples in crisis. And one of the biggest challenges I see that's happening in marriages, if I had to boil it down to one thing, it's that we, we no longer understand the biblical point of view of oneness. When we get married, the two, Scripture tells us, become one. I used that Scripture verse last week. Because oftentimes what we have today is two individuals that come together, they stand at an altar, they make promises to family and friends with full intentions of living their life after their own individual. It's almost like two people come together with their own set of expectations and their own set of blueprints and they're heading different ways and we're trying to be two individuals living under the same roof, sleeping in the same bed. But Scripture helps us understand that the moment we get married, it's no longer me, but it's forever we. And there's a certain level, this is going to go against culture, but there's a certain level of my identity that I leave behind as my identity now becomes engrafted with the person that I married because I am saying goodbye to who I was to become who we are. It's two, come on, becoming one. Remember last week we talked out of Genesis that God made Adam, and the word Adam, the name Adam, means all one. And and all one, God looked at all one, it says that he made both male and female, when he's just talking about Adam. 
And so he caused the sleep to come on Adam. And he didn't reach back into the dirt to get uh, to make woman, he reached inside of Adam and pulled out of his ri- out of him his rib and made woman. In other words, get the imagery. He pulled the feminine side out of man, of all one, and separated the two. And so when the two come together, the two then are becoming Adam, all one, one flesh again. Is that making sense? I think my screen's even excited about what I'm teaching today, all right? So let me take you with that thought to Genesis chapter number 2. And let me just, again, I'm not going to make a Bible study of today's message. I just want to give this as a backdrop, this whole idea of becoming one. Genesis 2, verse number 22, it says this. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man, and the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she, she was taken out of man, and that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united. You know, that's just, I want you, even though our screen's going crazy, I want you to focus on the word united. United, you can look at the other screens. United to his wife, watch this, and they shall become one flesh. They, they shall not become We're not prepared for marriage when we come to the marriage still intending to do all life just about us, but we got somebody to go to bed with every night. No, the two lives are blending and becoming one flesh, one life. And, and, and I want you to capitalize on this word united right here because in our English translations, and I looked at this in about uh, uh, at least eight translations, and, and our English language doesn't really, uh, doesn't really use that word the best that it could, united. In other words, when something is united, it becomes all tangled together. It's hard to separate. It's hard to determine where's the origin of each one. They, they're united together now, and we can't take one away without messing the other one up. Here's a, here's a better, simpler word that I want us to use as our, our working. United, really the best, closest kind of definition we can get in, from, in English from the Hebrew is the pursuit of oneness. To be united means to pursue oneness. And so, and, and by the way, let me just throw this in here. The proof of desire is in the pursuit. So if you say, I love you, then the proof of my desire of you is in my pursuit of you. If you say you love God, then the proof of the desire of God is in the pursuit of God. Hello? If you say you love money, then the proof of the desire is in chasing money. So here's what I want to do today. I read an article. I read a few articles, and some of them differ a little bit. You can Google this list if you want to. And so uh, I, I was reading the top 10 marriage killers, and I knew I couldn't do 10, and I probably can't even do 7, but I just kind of picked and chose some that I, I just felt that were relevant. And so we're just going to spend a couple minutes on each one. I'm not going to do a di- deep dive into each one. The top 10, uh, excuse me, the top 7 marriage killers in right now's generation. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Number one. Number one is overcommitment and exhaustion. That just, uh, I don't even need to be talking about marriage, do I? That, that is such a statement for Americans right now. Americans are overcommitted and exhausted. We have these little things that are called smartphones that we walk around with, and we can have instant access and instant information, but our brains were never created to know what's going on all the time, any minute around the world. We were created to live in a home with our family, in a village or a community with our neighbors, and be concerned about what Aunt Aunt B is going through and what the neighbor down the road, and I can minister to them, but our brains were not meant to handle all the access that we have, and most Americans, and then I go ahead to say most married couples are overcommitted and they are exhausted. Um, Simply put, we're worn out, and if we're worn out individually, how do we have any bandwidth left to pour into each other as we are trying to make two lives become one? Most, and I understand, most homes have both spouses working and kids are in sports and piano recitals and dance recitals and, and, and then going to church and, and life is just chaotic. 
Uh, it reminds me of what I seen one night as a kid on the late show. Uh, I, I couldn't sleep and I turned on. How many remember the late show and after that, the TV went off? <laughs> Beep. Yeah, okay. And, and there was this guy on there and he had this box with these broomsticks sticking up. And, and he put his plate on the br- br- broomstick and he was balancing it and he would spin it. Anybody remember this? And he would spin that thing and he would get going and everybody would and then he'd take another one and spin it on the next one. He'd get all the way down. I don't remember how many they were. Let's just say 10 for the sake of the message. And he'd get down all the way down to this one trying to balance it. And the crowd's going crazy because the first one is barely wobbling. There's somebody in this room today that's barely wobbling. And if something doesn't happen in this service, you fear that you might fall off the broomstick, you know what I'm talking about, and crash to the ground. And just in the nick of time, he would run down here and give that plate another spin, and then another spin, and then another spin. And again, by the time you get down here, oh, and it was this endless cycle. Some of us are living our lives like the guy that is spinning the plates. Uh, we start off in marriage, and we're spinning the plate, and whoo, this is good. Come on, baby, we're on the honeymoon. That plate is woohoo, it's spinning, man. It's spinning. But then reality sets in, and a little saucer shows up. Oh, you have them too. I don't know if you know anything about little saucers. They take twice as much spinning to keep them. Come on, parents, where are you? (laughs) And then you got your jobs and your careers and your hobbies and your church and your men and all, and it's hard and life is busy. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to dive deep onto these. I want everybody to pick one that we need to work on together as a team. And so let me give you just, again, these are, I'm almost embarrassed because I'm only giving you just real quick kind of preaching solutions. But it's going to be easy to preach, but it's going to be harder to work it out. So here's my solution for overcommitment is that You need to have a Sabbath. You need to have somehow in your schedule, no matter what sacrifices we need to make, we got to have a day where we call a time out and refuel our soul. Every Saturday is my Sabbath, and it's the day I refuel my soul. It's the day I eat my favorite meals. It's the day me and Patty take walks together. It's the day that we watch our favorite shows. It's the day that we take drives out in the country. It's whatever it is. It's no work, no phone, no email. It's just me and her. It's whatever refuels your soul. Curling up with a book, going fishing. Come on, guys. Whatever it is that refuels who you are. Uh, And if I'm talking about family, I'd say have a family day. All of our ministry life, and we live, please hear me, we lived as busy a life as everybody else, but every Friday, we count, my kids could count on every day until they were 18, every Friday was family day. Family day, and as the older they got, it started out with sheets in the living room as tents. <laughs> it ended up as they were teenagers. I'd tell Jake to take his mom out on a date and pay, and then I'd slip him a little money. And then I'd take Janessa out on a date, and I'd open the car door for her. And I said, any guy that doesn't open the car door for you, slam his fingers in the door, all right? <laughs> and then just have a family day. Come on. Your kids aren't going to accidentally grow up and love God. Come on, everybody, or you, right. Okay, number two, the number two uh, marriage killer is, uh, it has to do with financial conflict. And um, so financial conflict, I didn't really, this one's really not too hard to understand. I heard it said that about 80% of divorces are somehow financially related to. I don't know. I do know, though, there are three classes of people. There are the haves. There are the have-nots, and there are the have-not-paid-for-what-they-got. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. Herman and Mary got married, and, and Mary's family came from money, and she had a lot of money, brought a lot of money to the marriage, and, uh, and Herman's family didn't have any. And, and she tended to remind him all the time, boy, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have this nice home. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't drive that nice car. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have the most expensive set of golf clubs. And Herman finally got tired of it one day, and he said, well, if it hadn't been for you and your money, you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here either. <laughs> You know, sometimes money becomes the primary issue and it's out of balance. Here's my solution. My solution is this. Spend less or make more. (laughs) And when you make more, don't spend more also. 
my name is Ken. I'm very simple. I got three letters in my name. If you're expecting more than that, I apologize, all right? Spend less or make more. But let me get to the last one. How about make God number one? You see, so many of us want God involved in our finances, but we don't involve God in our finances. We want God to help us, but we don't follow his plan, his financial plan for our life. We live a very strict financial plan in this church. I live a very strict financial plan in my life. And I would just suggest to you that you need to make God number one in the area of your finances. Is it because God has a shortage? Absolutely not. It has everything to do with inviting him in. Let me just share something real quick. I wasn't planning on this. Some people have asked me, why is a tithe or why is 10% bringing that back to God important? Why can't it be 2%? Well, first of all, I believe we live under grace, and you can bring anything back to the Lord. But the 10 represents everything. So when you give 10% back to God, you're showing God you own everything. Come on. How many in here can count to 10? Everybody better raise their hand. See, the reason 10 represents everything is because every number after 10 is a repetition of the very same thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Then you start over. 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5. Then you start over again. 1, uh, or 2, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. See, I can't even count, you know. See, that's why 10. So get God involved in your finances. Number three, marriage killer, is unreal expectations. Is unreal expectations. The newlyweds had got married, and the groom said, Honey, now that we're married, I want to point out some of the issues that are in your life. <laughs> I mean, no, that's not a good way to start off, right? And she said, No problem, honey. Those issues that you want to point out are the very issues that kept me from getting a better husband. <laughs> I mean, no, two can fight, right, everybody, right? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but solution is don't expect your spouse to make you happy. What? See, we put so much on one another, we almost sometimes want our spouses to be to us only what God could be to us. And so, so don't expect them to make you happy. You need to determine, because how many know some people aren't going to be happy even if Jesus was there? You know what I'm talking about? So we have to determine that we're going to have a winning attitude outside of that. Um, and then lastly, let me throw this in here. Don't compete with one another, but complete one another. Does that make sense? Isn't it interesting when we're dating, it's the opposites that attract? Uh, and we'll say crazy things like, oh, I just love the way he listens when I talk. He's so sensitive and he listens to me. Oh. And then a few years into marriage, they come to see me and they say things like, man, he won't say nothing. He just doesn't say nothing. He just sits there. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's what attracted you to him. How many know opposites attract? Any opposites are married to each other in this room, right? Me and Patty weren't just opposites. Like, we were from different planets, like, just different worlds. She grew up in June and Ward Cleaver's home. Dinner was at 5.30 every day. Mom had an apron on. I never even heard of an apron, right? We didn't even have a kitchen table. What are you talking about, right? I went to her house the first time on Thanksgiving and freaked out because the TV wasn't going. Nobody was yelling at anybody. All you could hear was the dishes clink, clink. Would you like some more, Jack? Oh, yes, dear, I would. You know, I was like, what is going on? Like, can we have a little chaos? I'm out of control here, right? But listen, it's our differences that God uses to sanctify us. Your first year of marriage, you ever heard somebody say, yeah, that first year of marriage, whew, I was, I, I was learning all about how to live with that person. No, you weren't. You were learning about yourself. Because marriage is a mirror, and marriage begins to show you the rough edges you have, like nothing else can. Nothing else will show See, when I get mad at my buddy, I get in my truck and I leave. When I get mad at my wife, i got to go to the same bedroom with her. Right? Come on, everybody. And in other words, because I made promises that I was going to stay in this for rich or for poor, for sickness and health, 
for good days and bad days. And all of a sudden, I start seeing some things. And all of a sudden, I'm accountable now. She knows every movie I watch. Uh Uh-oh, I better pick them carefully. She knows every attitude I have. She knows every insecurity I have. So marriage becomes the very thing that God uses to rub the rough edges off of me. And so maybe I shouldn't get mad at her about that. Maybe I ought to thank God that he brought somebody in my life to complete me and sanctify, help sanctify me. Can I get an amen in the room today, right? For those of you that have a different, need a different illustration, let me give you one from St. Rocky Balboa. Anybody remember him? I'm a Rocky fan. I grew up with Rocky. I watched his movies probably at least a thousand times. And, and Rocky number two, Polly, comes to Rocky and says, what do you see in my sister? Like, what, why do you want to, why would you want to date her? And Rocky says, oh, well, uh, you know, Rocky says to her, well, she has gaps. And Polly says, what are you talking about, gaps? What does that mean? And Rocky responds, now Rocky's not the brightest, sharpest tool in the box, but this one, man, he hits. He says, well, I got gaps, and she's got gaps, and together we fill the gaps. Come on, right, everybody? Together. See, where I'm weak, she's strong, and vice versa. And it is those very things, if we're not aware of those, the devil will cause us to leverage those and fight with those things. And you always, and you never. But just remember, you chose that person. Mm -hmm. And so don't use them to compete. Just because you talk more doesn't mean that you compete and say, I'm better. Right? Okay, uh, let's move on. Number four is the lack of intimacy. It's the lack of of intimacy. And uh, uh, the, the Bible, if you continue to read that Genesis chapter number two, w- when God separated Adam and Eve, and then it, it eventually it says, and they were naked and unashamed. And when I talk about naked right here, settle down, man. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being emotionally transparent. And you might not know it, but that's what we need from one another more perhaps than anything else. I told the young men this and young men's disciple, if you'll start worshiping God, because so many men will say, well, I'm just not an emotional person. I don't know what to say. You come to church and you pay attention to the words on the worship songs and you sing those words and every once in a while break out of your shell and get your hands up just a little bit and woo, I don't know if anybody's noticing me. And you just start, all of a sudden your emotions will come to life because you're singing love songs to God that will eventually open up your emotions and you'll be able to express your emotions to the gift that God has put put in your life better. Ah, come on, everyone. It's the lack of intimacy. And when I talk about intimacy, they were unashamed. Can I show you my weakness and be unashamed? Can I take off my cape? Can I take off my letter S? Can I take off my Superman boots? Can I come out of the phone booth as Clark Kent and will you still love me? That's intimacy. Intimacy. Into me see. I'm going to let you know a part of me that nobody else knows. I'm going to show you my fears, my insecurities, my kryptonite. and, And I'm begging you, don't ever use that to leverage against me when we are opposed to one another. Uh, It's into me see. You're the one I've committed that I'm going to let you see who the real Clark Kent is behind all of this stuff. Uh huh. And I'm going to share. We're going to share our hopes with each other. We're going to share our dreams with one another. Men, let me just tell you this. Some of your wives are begging to hear your heart. They're begging to hear your dreams. They're begging to know where are we going. See, God made her a helpmate. And if you don't tell her where we're going, then she has nothing to help meet. It's either quiet because you're thinking or you're mad. I don't know, but anyway. Uh, intimacy, I'm going to share my hopes, my dreams, my fears, my frustrations. Here's some solutions. Uh, solutions to lack of intimacy. You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. Because mm-hmm. she don't know. He don't know what you deserve. You don't get what you deserve. Uh. I came home one day, and my wife keeps a spotless house. Don't you love when I tell the stories of how bad of a husband I was? Doesn't it make you feel better? I came home one day. She keeps a spotless house, and I, but I'm an organizational freak. I need things in order. If I don't have things in order, I start stressing out, and I start twitching, and you know, like that kind of thing. And I, it, it, I, I know. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying who it is. And I came home one day. The house was perfect, and I don't remember what was going on, but I needed a pair of scissors. And so I went to the drawer where the scissors are supposed to be. Because when God created the world, on the eighth day, he put the scissors in the right place. 
and the scissors weren't there. So I opened the drawer where the scissors were the last time, and the scissors weren't there. And I could feel like green, my skin turning green and twitching. And, 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 and I said, man, and I started getting angry and irritated. Where are the scissors? And, and, and I said, can we not put the scissors in the right place? I don't want to spend five minutes looking for the scissors. Does any person have this problem besides me? Because some of you are looking at me like, you are a nut. I'm a work in progress. The issue is you come here every Sunday to hear this nut preach, all right? So you must be nuttier. Anyway, we got in an argument over the scissors, and, and, then, and then she said, look, honey, later, after I was standing there in my shattered clothes because I'd come off of my hulkness, Isn't it funny the things we fight about? It's like it's never like, hey, I blew up grandma. Oh, great. No, it's like, ah, I forgot to put the cap on the toothpaste. I'm leaving you. You know, it's just, it's just crazy stuff. Come on now. And after I was done being irritated, she said something to me that changed our dynamic in marriage, and it helped me realize I don't get what I deserve. Because I wanted to say, and I think I probably did say, I deserve to come home to a house that's organized. Well, she didn't know that was my expectation. And she said that. She said, I didn't realize that was so important to you. If you need the scissors in a particular drawer, and she didn't say it like. Because <laughs> if I would have married a finger-snapping, head-popping woman, we would not be here. I would have blown up the whole universe by now. <laughs> I couldn't have dealt with that. Come on now, all right? You got to know your combination. Anyway, so all of a sudden what was happening, I didn't even realize, we started negotiating. I said to her, honey, look, i got to have things organized in my life. My, I come from a life that's chaotic. I come from a life of living out of crates and moving all the time and never. And, and it stresses me. It makes me, it brings me back to feeling out of control, feeling like things are changing. And so I don't know why I'm that way. It's an issue, but I need your help on this. See, I was taking off, my che- I was taking off the S. And she said, honey, that's fine. I can do that. All of a sudden, negotiation was happening. She said, I can do that. But if I do that, here's something I need from you. Oh, now we're bargaining. (laughs) See, it's a two-way street. It's not just my way. She said, honey, I love you enough to be one with you. And if that's something you need, that's something I can do. But while I'm promising to do that, let me just throw my chips on the table too. And say, but here's what I need. I need you not to treat me like I'm stupid. I need you not to yell at me. I need you not to raise your voice. And I said, I can do that. (laughs) What happened after that, I'm not telling you, but it was good. I'm telling you, all right? And as she was negotiating, she said, I need you not to treat me like I'm stupid. And and if you do, next time, I will stab those scissors in your neck. (laughs) And I have a scar You guys clapped a little too hard for that one. (laughs) Just a little too hard on that one. I'm not sure. Now we have a knife holder right beside our stove, and there's a slot for the scissors, and they've been there for 30 years. Come on, everybody. All right. All right. Um, uh, 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 Number uh, number five. I think I'm on number five. Marriage got boring. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Marriage just got boring. Isn't it interesting? Dating's not boring. It's exciting. Matter of fact, I hate to use this negative example, but I've talked to people that have had affairs, and they say, man, the affair was exciting. Well, why is marriage boring? It, 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 because marriage, we allow marriage to become maintenance. And, and when we are dating, we plan on fun, and we plan on adventure. Let me just say it another way. Uh, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. So keep on hammering married couples, because there will be a storm somewhere along the way. All right, here's my solution. Uh, I might have messed up. Did I? Oh, it's just real simple. Plan some fun. <laughs> Look at how quiet. Like, oh, what is that? We're married now. <laughs> Plan some fun. Date one another still. Come on, right, everybody? Uh, write love notes to one another. Oh, sick. I can't do that. <laughs> you used to. 
Put little notes under their pillow. Go to dinner every once in a while. Take a drive together. Start a hobby together. Be romantic. Men, take a shower. You know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Number six. I just said that to make sure you were still with me. Number six is spiritual incompatibility. I said to the young men on Tuesday night, I said, stop looking for a girlfriend and look for a spouse. Because sometimes what you, uh, I can't say that here. (laughs) Skip on ahead. Stop recreational dating and all the recreations that society is telling you that's okay. Okay. (laughs) Here's another way of saying it. Those who go against the grain of God's will are going to get splinters. How many know, right? Okay. Okay. Here's my solution. This could be a little bit for the dating couples, but here's my solution on this one, and that is date only believers. Just date believers. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked together. And you say, yeah, but we're already married, and she went and got saved, and now I don't know if I believe, or the other way around. And listen, if you got married and you weren't believers, and now one is, and most of the time, oftentimes, it's the woman that becomes a believer before the guy. Uh, Here's all I would say to you, and if you're watching online, don't get weird just because you got saved. Don't come home every Sunday and preach to him and tell him why he's no good. Mm -hmm. I met a guy one time, he was in the church, and he liked this girl in the church, and so he was going to ask her out on a date. He did, and the girl's response to him was, no, I won't go out on a date because right now in my life I'm dating Jesus. Now, I understood what she meant, but he didn't have a clue. It's like, whoa, how's that possible, right? And, and, and what she was really saying is, look, I'm just committed to growing in Jesus right now. I'm working on my own life. Well, like a year later, I seen them together on a date. And, they, and I was like, whoa. Like, I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, we, we finally got together. And I'm thinking, like, well, did she break up with Jesus? Like, <laughs> And I got some advice for you. I mean, I'm a pastor. I need to help you. If she broke up with Je- if if Jesus and her are broke up, how many know it wasn't Jesus' fault? How many know, right? Anyway, all right, just don't get weird. Number seven, let me do this last one, and we'll, I'll be out of your way. Number seven, a uh, marriage killer is selfishness. Uh, can we just face it? Uh, most of us get married for selfish reasons. We really do. Um, I didn't know enough at that age to not get married for selfish reasons. The original proposal, the original proposal was, I will be with you and I will serve you. Will you accept my proposal to spend the rest of my life serving you? Oh, oh yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> he just moved three foot away from his girlfriend right there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Um, and so, because uh, again, I already said this, but dating is, has serving in mind. You ever notice that? Dating, man, oh, it has serving in mind. And marriage has a getting in mind. And if you're not getting, it's because you're selfish. It's because you're selfish. S- solution to this, real quick, is, uh, and the Bible tells us this, serve one another. This is where we get that verse about women submit to your husbands. And that verse is so overused because prior to that verse, it says, submit or serve one another. Yeah. And until I get that verse down, I have no right to quote the other verse because we should submit to one another. All right? Um, Now, remember, our word is pursue. And I need to close up. I'm just about out of time. But I want to at least give you two things that you could take home and work on. Now, it would be in a perfect world. I wish I had all the married men in the room, and I'd say this to you without your wives hearing. And and then I'd I'd show up and talk to all the married ladies in the room without your husbands hearing. But I'm going to say it to both of you, so you got to keep each other accountable to what I'm getting ready to preach. All right? If you do not, if you're married and you don't want to be accountable to this, stick your fingers in your ears so all of us can see you and call you an idiot, all right? Okay, so remember our word is pursue. We have to pursue one another. We're becoming united, one flesh, so the word is pursue, okay? So men, hear this. Men, pursue her with words of affection. Pursue. I'm only talking about words here. I'm not talking about all the other reasons. I could do a whole message on how to pursue one another, but men, let me give you a game changer. Pursue her with words of affection. She is starving to hear how you feel. 
and pursue her. Remember last week I said, don't compliment her on how good she's vacuuming the floor. (laughs) Now, women, you got to compliment him on how good he's doing something because that's his language, right? But pursue her with words of affection. And guys, let me give you a clue. I wish you were in the room by yourself, but I'm just going to say this in front of your wives. When I say pursue her with words of affection, those words have to be non-sexual, non-sexual words. Because how many of you know men can make anything sexual? Ladies, be careful. Just I mean, You could be driving down the road in your truck and the car's out of alignment, and she could look over and say, you know, we need to get our tires rotated. And he'll look over and go, you better believe I'll rotate your tires, baby. <laughs> men don't, you know I'm right about it. And look, the ladies are going, yeah, that's my husband, Yeah. I, don't, I can't help it. It's this thing called testosterone. It drives me crazy. Right? Okay. Anyway, sorry. I got to. <laughs> Some men are sitting here going, I don't know how to do that. I just. Okay, let me give you a clue. Men tell her, I love you. Not right now. I love you because. And then fill in the blank. Think about it. I love you because. I love you because you brought stability to my life. I love you because I'd never been able to fulfill the dreams God put on my heart if you hadn't come on and championed me and praised me every step of the way. Right? Now, I had a little time to rehearse that. So, guys, I'm not expecting you to know that right off the top of your head. Okay, women, okay, men, you pursue her with words of affection. Watch this. Now, women, pursue him with words of affirmation. Remember last week? You get what you praise. God inhabits the praises of his people. You watch, men will rise to how, whatever you praise. I am a direct result of her not leveraging my past against me, but praising where we were going. And every milli-inch step I took toward that, she was great at praising me. It's the only reason I'm here today. So women, pursue him with words of affirmation. You get what you praise, not what you, not what you complain about. Um, and let me just... I hate that the men are in the room, but ladies, especially young ladies that haven't figured this out, listen, men are way more insecure than you think they are. They come across strong. They come across gruff. But they're way more insecure than you realize. Because mommy used to hang their picture up on the refrigerator and brag on little Johnny's pictures. But now he seems that he can't do anything right and the boss is mad, and the business isn't going as good, and the cars broke down, and Junior has questions that he don't have answers to, and he feels stretched by society, and now we live in a world that society is beating him up, and society is trying to confuse what it even looks like to be a man anymore, and men are being attacked in the worst kind of way. So women, here's my biggest thing I hear from women. Well, I just wish my husband would be more of a spiritual leader. Okay, let me give you a little advice. Ask him to pray over the Thanksgiving meal. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. You got to start somewhere. Well, he don't even know how to pray. I know he doesn't. And he's going to say something like, ah, because you're going to ask him in front of all the (laughs) in-laws. And he's going to real nervously say something like, ah, Lord, thank you for the turkey (laughs) and all these little turkeys we have. (laughs) Amen. Don't complain about that. Women, let me tell you how to use words of affirmation. Later when you're doing the dishes together and everything, come up behind and say, babe, the way you prayed over that turkey, (laughs) my man, mm, I'm telling you, that turned me on more than anything that has ever happened. Get all up close to him with your dishpan hands, uh, (laughs) babe, then kind of nibble on his ear a little bit and then say, would you pray for the Christmas meal too? And watch Christmas come around. That man will get up and say, Almighty God, in the name of Holy Jesus, uh, thank you for this ham. Thank you for the pig that you raised. Uh, Thank you for Porky and all of his relatives. Uh, I thank you that you're the great God Almighty. Right? Come on now. Come on, men. How many know I'm right about this? Can I hear an amen, right? Okay. (laughs) Okay. I got to end right there. I'm way out of time. Um. Listen, divorce is a real thing. And while we're trying to help people not crash in the ditch, 
Um, we don't want to condemn anybody that's already been in the ditch or struggling in the ditch. And, and so what I want to challenge you, if you're here and you're dating, you're a young couple, it doesn't really matter. You're not in this to try it out, okay? Um, I was going to give you some consequences right here of divorce. I, I may, uh, I'll either try to include them next week or I might do a little uh, online teaching on that because I'm out of time. Um, one of the things that we're very privileged to have is uh, a couple by the name of Vic and Monique. Uh, Vic is here with his daughter today. Uh, they have been a tremendous help in this area in our valley. They minister to people in all kinds of different churches. And we've had a number of people uh, from our church that have hung out with you guys and you've blessed them. And I just want to applaud you and Marriage Mosaic and helping us on this journey. And um, I asked if he could be here today and... and um, and they are starting a couple of things, uh, uh, perhaps, if there's an interest, a new marriage life group. I, I can't do it all, guys. I'm just up here doing a little 40-minute message, but we just can't answer all the requests. But I believe that you, there, there's a hunger. There's m many young men showing up saying, Ken, I want to love God and my family more. I just need the tools. So thank you so much. They said they would start a life group uh, if, if there are people that are interested in that. And you don't have to, you could be at any stage. And how many know we're never too old to learn new tricks, right, everybody? Did anybody get anything out of today? All right. And then also, uh, if you've at all been familiar with the book or the marriage mentoring, uh, How We Love, it's a phenomenal book. I should have put a picture of it. But they're also starting a life group on how we love parenting. So young families, you're trying to figure out, man, how do I parent? I, I've got strong-willed kids. I've got kids in rebellion. Whatever they are, uh, I would just... Uh, I asked Vic if he would just stay right here. If you want to come up and say hi to him right afterwards, uh, you could take a connection card if you're interested in either one of those because maybe you don't have time to stand up here and just put, put your name. Please follow directions on this. Put your name and your email, and don't come to me afterward and say, you already have my email. If you do that, may the fleas of a thousand camels find your armpits, all right? <laughs> just follow directions. Okay, so anyway... Put your name and your email because I'm going to turn them over so that they can email you without having to call me every other card that didn't do that, okay? And so if you're interested in the, uh, how we love parenting or uh, the marriage, uh, life, would this be also something that like maybe second marriages and that could come to? Okay, and so they don't have to be 25, right? And so I just wanted to say that clear. So one of those two. Listen, we have a tremendous resource right here. And, and if you keep calling and asking me, I don't always have the answer. I just gave you everything I know. I'm out, okay? That's all I got. Badee, badee, okay? That's all I got, folks, okay? But really, there is wealth in a, a counsel, wisdom. There is wisdom in counsel. So uh, utilize this wonderful tool. Um, we have made a commitment. They don't even know this yet, but we're going to begin to support their ministry so they can continue to help make families strong in this uh, valley. Amen, everybody? Okay. All right. I got to end. So would you stand with me all over this place and let me conclude today?